Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the afternoon session of Sea Machines. Um, uh, if you're just joining us, I'm Christy Anderson, um, and the conference has been organized by myself and um, Jason Nguyen. This afternoon, the first session, session number two, is on culture. And I would first like to welcome our first speaker of the afternoon, Nicholas Mack, who is arts editor at the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. He will be presenting a talk on phalansteries at sea. Nicholas. Yes, hello. Um, um, thank you, um, Christy. I'm very happy to be here this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me to the conference and enter the land of the Huron Renda, the Seneca and the Mississauga. I want to start this presentation with a closer look at um, uh, the works of Charles Fourier in the context of what is called here sea machines. So Fourier, who was born in, uh, uh, in 1772 and died in 1837, is basically best known as a proto-socialist utopian thinker who had a great influence on Karl Marx's economic theory, he was a visionary in many respects. He was credited with coining the word feminism, and he was among the first to demand in France the right to work for women and uh, wages for reproductive work. He criticized the nuclear family for its oppressive character and demanded that all sexual preferences, including homosexuality, shall be lived out freely. And he predicted climate change as a consequence of an exploitative capitalism when even the term was not uh, yet kind, uh, resulting in, in landscape slides, as he said, and the deterioration of the climate that would make the polar regions as temperate as the Mediterranean. He didn't describe that as a disaster, but as a possible chance for a new form of um, ocean farming. But it's less known that Fourier worked fanatically on the biggest sea machine ever designed. Uh, a project that would have been counted among uh, the big utopian uh, geoengineering ambitions of modernity if it was uh, more known. Uh, Fourier dreamt of a what he called citric acid that once spread in the oceans would give the sea the flavor of lemonade. Uh, and he dreamt of ways of desalinate the oceans and breed even new water creatures. Um, that sparked, uh, uh, of course, many literary responses. Uh, to that uh, utopia. But Fourier's most enduring legacy might be the phalanstery, the plan to replace cities and villages by an endless series of housing archipelagos. You can see here one of the drawings that have been made after his death, uh, and it bears a resemblance, as you can see, with the castle of Versailles, which is quite important because Fourier's phalansteries were designed to house around 1,600 people in what he called a social palace which also, as I said, looked like a, a Versailles for the people. And in Fourier's vision, the whole country would be reorganized by a network of interconnected philanthropies, self-sustaining, as he called themselves, archipelagos in the countryside where all members would live together and share the benefits of their agricultural and manufacturing production. Uh, Fourier, and this is maybe important for this context here, prominently uses again and again the metaphor of the archipelago which now, as we all know, it has become quite an uh, important term in architectural theory. So the phalanstery was uh, a precursor to modern network theories. It would send, you can see it here in an illustration we made, um, uh, via signal towers, information about produce or workforce needed um, in the community to other phalansteries, like ships communicating with light signals at night. Jobs would be assigned based on interest and desires. Unpleasant work, uh, Fourier wrote, would be automated. So it's also a fantasy about uh, a world of leisure after the end of work as we know it, written in the early 19th century. And um, uh, in this building that has a central park and two lateral wings, 
uh, which also evokes again the idea of a Versailles for the people, uh, where everyone would have like, access to the formerly exclusive choice of a privileged aristocratic elite. Uh, there would be space for education, for childcare, for collective dinners, for feasts, and for the what for he called liberation of human passions. So you can say that the philanthropy was a fantasy that made every worker and farmer a sun king. In its uh, spatial organization, the philanthropy was the model for what we call social housing now. Mm. And many architects, including Le Corbusier, referred to Fourier. But Fourier's living complex was not built around the idea of work and efficient accommodation of workers, but rather around the idea of the feast and the celebration of human passions after the end of work, as we know. So these liberated passions, as he calls them, rather than capitalist efficiency, should be the foundation of work and relationships in these archipelagos. So for years, phalansteries were supposed to be a field of experimentation and freedom beyond the social, moral, and economic confines of the city, kind of a counter island. And the most successful Fourierian experiment is the phalanstery um, in Geese called the Family Stair. I'll show you an image here. It's a museum today. You can go there and, and, and see it, but it's partly even still inhabited. Um, it was founded by Jean Baptiste Andre Godin, uh, the owner of a successful stove factory in Geese who embarked on building this social palace in the 1840s to improve the living conditions of uh, his workers and uh, encourage what he called social sympathy in a philanthropy next to his factory. Education was free and hot water, you can see it here, uh, from the factory filled a public swimming pool, which was a revolution at the time. Children were taken care in of uh, by two kindergartens, allowing the mothers to work and relax. Each of the three building blocks had a roof courtyard here, an image of the 60s, where children could play in all weather. Reunions, concerts, and festivities could take place all year long, which was an old obsession of Fourier's who lived in an overheated Paris apartment stuffed with jungle plants. Produce was sold here in the Falan Street in a shop run by workers. I show you again the inner courtyard that was used for um, celebrations and uh, festivities and feasts and banquets. So it may, might be not by coincidence that uh, the workers' housing unit and the luxurious cruise ship cabin as two opposite forms of hyper-efficient accommodation emerged at the same time in the 1840s. While Godin embarks on his plans to build this uh, family stair, uh, P&O cruises offer the first uh, uh, passenger cruising service of the world in the 1840s too. So both the cruise ship and the philanthropy put the idea of pleasure and collective leisure at the heart of it, their design. An idea that unfortunately, as we know, was eliminated from social housing later. Um, but it was Victor Considérant, Fourier's most influential scholar, who drew the parallel between the philanthropy and the steamship, stating that, I quote, it might be easier to house 1800 men right in the middle of the ocean then firmly on the soil of both in the French countryside. For considérant both this, the, the ship and the philanthropy were spaces that Michel Foucault later coined as heterotopias. We uh, already talked earlier on in this uh, conference about this term of uh, heterotopia. Um, so it's interesting to see, uh, this is, a, oh, this is an uh, irritated uh, announcement by the Texas State Times when uh, Considérant uh, uh, went on a ship with his followers and sailed over to, to Texas, socialists coming to Texas to found uh, uh, um, uh, Philan Street. So the histories of ship design and mass housing, uh, both forms of utopian spaces continue to be strongly intertwined in the 20th century. As you can see here on the original cover of Le Corbusier's seminal book, uh, a collection of essays called Vers in Architecture. Um, the cover bears the picture of a modern cruise ship. On the title and inside, you find evocative juxtapositions of steamships and Greek temples, exemplifying shapes refined through constant repetition. The architect Le Corbusier admired ships for their rational organization of space within a severely limited area. And the sea played a major part in his self-promotion as an architect, poet, searching for the new, 
on the margins of society, on the beaches, and um, uh, far away from the cities. The Corbusier wrote that he discovered the shell-based shape of his modular spiral during a storm at sea while traveling from the harbor to New York on board of a ship. Here an original ske uh, sketch where he states abord uh, du cargo Vernon Saint Hood, um, so on board of the ship Vernon Saint Hood on the way to New York uh, in 1946. Uh, Le Corbusier writes, um, there was a frightful storm and for the rest of the time, a strong swell. There to the roaring of the storm, while the boat rolled and tossed heavily, I drew up a scale of figures. So he really creates this myth of the man uh, exposed to the forces of, of nature at, at sea who in, reinvents uh, the very uh, shape of architecture on a, on a ship. Also, Le Corbusier described his Unité d'Habitation, the tall residential block erected in Marseille from 1947 to uh, 52, as an autonomous vertical city modeled after the idea of the modern cruise ship. The building had internal shopping streets and recreational facilities like a pool on the roof. You can you see it here uh, to the right uh, behind the chimney, um, a feature that he saw on the 1927 Arundora Star, the first cruise ship equipped with a pool. Already in the late 19th century, cruise ships had adopted the features of luxurious hotels and uh, residential buildings. German ship owner Albert Balling sent his Augusta Victoria, that you see here, an ocean liner that commuted normally between Hamburg and New York on a 57-day cruise in the Mediterranean Sea because uh, the vessel couldn't deal with winter storms uh, on the passage of the Atlantic. So uh, it became a profitable asset uh, while being sent uh, for this purpose to the Mediterranean Sea. So this marks a bit uh, the shift from ocean liners to cruise ships that go in circles in uh, a pleasurable environment. Mm. The future of fashionable cruise ship um, design um, sorry, uh, it, it, it's also interesting if you look at the uh, equipment of these boats with, with furniture, that in many designs fields like, like furniture, there was a mutual and somehow dialectic relation of the ship and, and modern architecture. And uh, if you look into furniture, the fashionable cruise ship design, as it was called, meant heavy chairs that would not move on a rolling ship, while um, in modernist houses, the iconography of the ship led to an aesthetic lightness of the so-called boat objects that would have caused stability problems on a real ship. And at this point, of course, ship cruises were still considered uh, an expensive luxury. Mm. The de democratization of cruise ships only happened in the 1960s, again, parallelly with a new wave of social mass housing. So again, here you can see there's a parallel between uh, the, the growth of buildings and the growth uh, of ships. The Queen Elizabeth II that you see here that was operated by Cunard Lines since 1969 was the first so-called one-class cruising ship um, with an interior that borrowed more from spaceship than classic ocean liner design. The furniture here looked uh, more like an anticipation of an uh, extraterrestrial rather than a maritime world. I mean, it's interesting to see that there were basically no luxurious cabins uh, and cheap cabins. It was, uh, as said, a one-class cruising ship that tried to democratize the idea of, of the cruise. Then, of course, cruises gained again in pop uh, popularity with the airing of The Love Boat in 1977, where cruise ships were shown as romantic opportunities for couples that can meet on board and get closer and uh, solve their marital problems on sea. And by the 80s, the first megaclass uh, ship for the mass cruising market was designed and the architectures of the vessels, vessels soon changed from big boats like this one to floating mass housing as we see it now here uh, some years ago in Venice. Now, uh, as said early on, uh, this practice of taking these boats into Venice canals and banned, but still these um, uh, ships continue to grow echoing ironically the architecture um, that travelers want to escape. So boats like the Symphony of the Seas and the Global Dream, also very telling names of course, are both like around 340 meter long 
57 meter high billion dollar vessels with space for 9,500 passengers and 2,500 crew members. So it's not, it cannot be designed uh, as a building, but rather it has to be designed under uh, urbanistic uh, uh, premises and scales. Mm. Ship designers were able to introduce new shapes because of the, the hull's new giant width with up to like 60 meters. You see here the wonder of the seas uh, with the so-called new open atrium structure. Um, uh, the wonder of the seas is at over uh, 230,000 gross tons, one of the biggest cruise ships in the world, uh, and has an atrium and 18 decks, so really like a big housing complex. Before the pandemic in 2019, more than 20 million people, half of them, by the way, Americans, booked to stay on board of one of these uh, over 300 uh, uh, operating cruise ships. Mm. And more uh, than a third of the passengers are over 60, more than half of them over 50. As mentioned earlier today, cruise ships face, of course, a lot of criticism for their highly exploitative treatment of crew members and most of all for uh, their devastating CO2 footprint despite all efforts to run the vessel on liquefied natural gas. It's interesting to see that this criticism has been reflected in the new cruise ship design. Uh, and the iconography hasn't been analyzed lately, but it's quite telling. And it's interesting to see that there is a, a new form of introduction of green spaces, of things that funnily relate to the idea of Fourier to create an internal space of gathering uh, uh, an artificial jungle where people could spend time and have fun and get lost uh, and, uh, and wander and uh, wander around like in a, in a fun palace or uh, in, in a kind of new Babylon. Mm. It's interesting to see that more and more cruise ships are designed by architects like the designer of the Burj Al Arab, Tom Wright, who designed a part of the um, uh, vessel called Edge. And it's also interesting to see that uh, giving shape to an estimated uh, market of three, uh, $30 billion per year, cruise ship design has become almost a seismographic indicator of societal desires and irritations. So Siegfried Schindler and Kai Bunge, responsible designers of the German AIDA Club and uh, Europa II vessels, compare the vessel already to an ideal town with restaurants and shops and entertainment and wellness areas they say, I quote, it's like urbanism. You have to concentrate discourse theaters and bars in one spot in a kind of downtown. And of course, it's interesting in, uh, in all these interviews that they never mention the staff cabins, the windowless, let's say, working class neighborhoods that also exist on the deck. They're never mentioned and never shown in these, um, in these vessels. Also, you have to say that cruise ship design is a world with old school and often uh, sexist assumptions on the psychology of form and the boat's supposedly uh, feminine body. Uh, Ida vessels bear giant red lips introduced in 1994 as, I quote, a seductive and erotic signature decor by designer Felix Büttner. While the red and golden interior design of the new Aida, the first ship of the so-called Sphinx series, should convey the message, I quote again, I am a diva, I am beautiful and brave, according to uh, its designer team, Schindler and Bunga. In other cases, um, recent cruise ship design emphasizes closeness to, if not identity, with nature. So you find on the one hand kind of questionable ideological assumptions on, uh, on the gender. On the other hand, you find a, a whole avalanche of um, a design proposals that should emphasize closeness to uh, nature, identity with nature. On board of the Edge vessel, uh, the famed uh, designer Patricia Aquiola has created a space called the Eden. Uh, I call, uh, quote, library of plants with a restaurant and a so-called tree of life in the middle. You can see it here, the tree of life, uh, reminiscent of Fourier's jungle spaces. Why don't we have big greenhouses on board? Maybe as a part of a public park, asks Dieter Bell, co-founder of the design agency Three Deluxe. TOE Cruises and Royal Caribbean Cruises have commissioned him to reconceptualize the cruise ship radically for the future. Bell's answer, uh, I quote, is, as society changes, the dissolution of the nuclear family will have effects on cabin design too. 
we will see multi-generational housing models and communal living units on cruise ships too. Quite a Fourierian idea in its skepticism towards singles and nuclear families. So Brel sees cruise ships not as a floating retiree home, but as a form of avant-garde urbanism. With uh, fresh, uh, fresh vegetable grown on board, the vessel becomes a floating farm, ideally self-sustaining, uh, a self-sustaining organism, he writes like a phalanstery. Also, the dissolution of work and leisure will play a role, Brel continues. There's a new class of customers who will withdraw to cruise ships and for a week to concentrate on a work project. Cruise ships can become self-sustaining, eco-friendly swimming cities, he continues. Isn't that a beautiful alternative to living on land for best ages and digital nomads? Um, so mm, while this is emphasized, um, uh, Comfort and security are the other main sales arguments uh, to attract people to basically spend time on a boat or even move there for, for a while. So cruise ships are also floating smart cities equipped with surveillance cameras and tracking devices like wristbands to control where the children are, but also to direct people to the next shop. What is sold as a space of freedom is also a floating panopticon. Some ship owners like Harper Lloyd still offer expeditions to the Arctic seas, of course, aggravating um, the climate change related melting of the ice, while the design of the vessels often claims to raise awareness with ice motifs on the carpet, onboard sculptures made out of collected plastic from the seas, etc. Um, but more and more ship designers see the necessity of a radical change. And according to Schindler and Bunge, the cruise ship should itself become a destination in the future rather than a moving object. I quote them from their um, future directory, directory text. This might end at a point where the big cruise ship will be immobilized as an artificial island in a nice surrounding with even more restaurants and more recreational facilities on board. And people might use smaller boats for day trips and uh, get there and leave again. Many designers seem to point this way. They draw cruise ships that mimic a floating island like Yacht uh, Island design in London, uh, where you can clearly see that uh, the boat basically uh, morphs into the shape of an island uh, with an artificial uh, um, a volcano and a river coming down. So the ship kind of uh, denies its character as a ship and becomes a floating island. Mm, other plants, um, so oh, this is the interior. You see, this is uh, still quite conservative, more like a, a Baroque castle. Um, other proposals like Atlantis too, uh, suggest that the, the, the cruise ship will become an exclusive floating city with even a, a little airport for helicopters, a heliport uh, and a giant roofed park, controlled access and, and a sharp social two-class divide of customers and staff again staff is living here in the belly of that structure, uh, almost like a dystopic idea uh, of metropolis. Mm. Uh, all of these vessels bear resemblance with the principal layout of the phalanstery. You have a roofed courtyard and uh, you have a very efficient architecture built around it, as also does Vincent Calabout's utopia of the floating lily pad, eco city, a network of floating self-sustaining biomorph uh, archipelagos. The latest uh, giant cruise ship bears a telling name. It's simply called Utopia. You can see it here. This is taken from um, a video, um, a promotional video. Uh, you can move to Utopia. You can buy apartments there. There's even a Utopia ambassador that tries to uh, convince people to buy an apartment between 4.4 uh, million and 23 million. Um, uh, dollars per apartment. Uh, there is, uh, as you can see, a Utopia showroom on Rodeo Drive where you could test how it would feel to, to live on that boat. Uh, um, again, you see it's a kind of a very uh, palazzo-like architecture, uh, nothing left of the Elizabeth II democratic uh, futuristic style. So, and, um, and it's interesting to see that there's also a promotional video that should encourage people to uh, start to work there um, on the boat. 
uh, they are called the pioneers and they will be so fortunate to work uh, in this uh, type of ship, uh, the, the video says, uh, and people will be, uh, be taken around the world on Utopia. So even Utopia has this clear divide, a video for customers and a video for uh, possible staff members. It has, of course, uh, the architect Thomas Tilberg, who is uh, dubbed a famous architect who explains uh, how functionality and beauty uh, on this ship will, will work together. So basically, Utopia is the ultimate like zombie version of a phalanstery with a similar formal layout, extremely rational accommodation, and inner courtyard for different uh, forms of entertainment, uh, a world after the end of work as we know it, uh, a leisure world uh, built around the idea of the collective feast. And although it's formally strikingly similar, of course, the phalanstery was an inclusive utopia with uh, uh, while cruise ships are still like this one, uh, of course, spaces of segregation. And um, while the original phalanstery combined affordable housing with educational facilities and a very exuberant idea of collective feasts, access and fun for everybody, uh, the latter seems to have uh, been almost entirely commercialized and extracted to the floating mass houses complex. In contemporary literature, the wildly popular cruise ship is not a heterotopia anymore, but a stage of grotesque dramas, as in David Foster Wallace's uh, supposedly fun thing I'll never do again, wonderful text about a cruise ship experience, or Jonathan Franzen's corrections where Al, the father, finally falls off a vessel uh, during a cruise. But maybe, and uh, I want to close on, on that remark, Contemporary architecture could learn something elemental from the very questionable, bizarre iconography of contemporary cruise ships, because the analysis of the philanstery's DNA in the ballrooms and pools and in the water slides and in the theaters on these vessels could maybe help to reintroduce to future mass housing the long eliminated idea of the collective feast that was so important to the inventor of social palaces the philanstery, Charles Fourier. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to discuss with you. Thanks. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, and just to remind people, please feel free um, at any time during the session or the talks to put questions into the Q&A, um, which you can find along the bottom of the Zoom, uh, your Zoom screen. You can just click on the Q&A and pop your question in there. So thank you so much. Our next speakers are Meredith Martin, professor in the Department of Art History and Institute of Fine Arts in New York um, at NYU, and Jillian Weiss, professor in the Department of History at Case Western Reserve University. They will be co-presenting a talk entitled Sun King at Sea. Thank you, Meredith and Jillian. Thank you. Let me just pull the PowerPoint up. Oh God, I hope my desktop is not a disaster. There we go. Uh, can everyone see? Yes, okay. So just a quick thanks to Jason and Christy so much for uh, inviting us to this event. We're really excited to be among a community of scholars whose work has been so inspiring to our own. Um, and we're also really happy to be talking about our co-authored book, which just came out. Um, and in a bit of shameless self-promotion, I will somehow figure out how to put the link to the talk in the chat, which I may have to do afterwards since I've shared my screen. But anyway, thank you. Jillian's going to start us off. So uh, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, our talk today is drawn from um, our book, The Sun King at Sea, Maritime Art and Galley Slavery in Louis XIV's France. And in it, we look at a wide range of artistic productions among them ship designs and naval treatises, weapons, paintings, and prints to explore the neglected genre of French maritime art and the forced labor integral to its creation. We focus on the thousands of esclave Turc or um, otherwise known as enslaved Turks or simply Turks who were captured or purchased to row on Louis XIV's expanding fleet of oared vessels based in Marseille. Hailing from the Ottoman Empire, Morocco, they were distinguished both in life and art by a top knot that can be seen in this design by Charles Lebrun 
and in this naval cannon by Jean Bobet, which may have been used in the French bombardments of Algiers during the 19, uh, 1680s. Although galleys had lost much of their practical utility by the mid 17th century, oared vessels retained considerable symbolic value due in large part to their dependence on enslaved labor in violation of France's long-standing tradition of free soil. As presumed Muslims, Turks signified Louis XIV's mastery of the Mediterranean and helped cast him as the most Christian king, conqueror of both foreign infidels and domestic uh, heretics. Their enslavement helped deflect attacks from European rivals regarding the commercial agreements that Louis XIV had maintained with the Ottoman Sultan. Pressed into service at royal arsenals, Turks also helped build and decorate the ships they rode, and they assisted in the production of other artworks that circulated between coast and capital to, to proclaim royal power. So today our plan is to focus on one aspect of our book, and it concerns a series of shipbuilding manuals produced by naval officers in Marseille between the 1680s, when the fleet, the fleet was nearing its zenith around 40 to 50 vessels and about 200, uh, about 2,000 enslaved Turks, and the 1720s, when the number of both had um, begun to decline. And we'd like to look at three examples from this period. First is a series of drawings likely connected to a 1680 treatise on building and equipping galleys. Second is a manuscript from 1703 that situates French galleys within a humanist debate about orbed vessels going back to antiquity. And third is a memoir from 1721 that aims to resuscitate galleys and professes nostalgia for a way of life that they represented. As you can see, enslaved Turks feature prominently in all three of these works. Um, they're typically chained and performing some sort of labor, often under the threat of violence. And their presence reveals some of the ways that galley slaves were used to make claims by different constituencies. Not only the monarchy, but also the um, naval officers responsible for creating these texts whose interests were sometimes opposed to the crowns. So rather than purely top-down expressions of royal propaganda, in other words, galleys and enslaved Turks accommodated multiple and conflicting needs and desires, signifying naval glory, political utility, um, religious fervor, nostalgic fantasy, and so on. Turks most uh, obviously embedded the continuing importance of galleys. With lineage that stretched back to the ancient world, galleys were the premier vessels of holy war for fighting Muslims and also Protestants after Louis XIV's revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, when Huguenots attempting to escape the kingdom were condemned to the oar. Using Turk-driven galleys to demonstrate Catholic piety was important for French naval officers with connections to the Knights of Malta, the self-proclaimed protector of Christianity in the Mediterranean. These professional warriors were searching for ways to carry on the venerated tradition of fighting Islam at sea, even as real naval combat was beginning to ebb. We'd like to suggest, however, that Turks performed other symbolic work in these manuals to two compensatory ends. First, their visual and textual depictions attempted to counteract a decline in maritime combat resulting from commercial and diplomatic agreements among France, the Ottoman Empire, and the North African states. And second, their portrayal attempted to counteract a perceived reduction in status among the naval officers who wrote and illustrated treaties about galleys, works that reflected increasing state control over building ships and treatises, uh, uh, um, and arguably over old guard noblemen who were unreconciled to new roles as service-oriented elites rather than feudal warriors like their ancestors. Representations of Turks underscore some of the tensions at the heart of these ships 
and the latent violence that accompanied it. The project to expand the royal arsenal of Marseille under the direction of Jean-Baptiste Colbert uh, began soon after Louis XIV conquered the city in 1660. In addition to facilities for constructing galleys, the complex contained artist studios as well as schools of hydrography and construction. And there, as both Larry Ferreira and Margaret Schott have shown, Naval officers were taught how to build and operate galleys, and they were instructed in other kinds of useful skills um, like drawing and geography and mathematics, skills that had come to be considered as vital for noblemen in the service of the state. Colbert had established these schools in part to de demystify and to standardize shipbuilding, and in so doing, to take power away from craftsmen and to place it in the hands of the crown. An important byproduct of shipyard schools was the acquisition of shipbuilding manuals, whose number increased dramatically after the late 1670s. These books supposedly laid bare the secrets of construction that craftsmen had long guarded, though in fact the technical drawings they included were often inaccurate and unreliable for building a navigable vessel. As such, arsenal craftsmen mostly ignored them, continuing to follow their own orally transmitted methods. And indeed, the primary audience for Louis XIV era maritime manuals were not builders, but the officers themselves and their royal patrons. The claims that these texts and images made, as much technical as they are social, political, and anthropological, following themes associated with the genre of naval architecture from the 16th century. One significant early work in this genre is Lazel de Baif's De Re Navali, which first appeared in 1536. A humanist scholar who served as the French ambassador to Venice, Baif wrote his manual to try to persuade King Francis I to build a galley fleet on the Venetian model and along the lines of ancient heroes like Caesar, who had waged war against the so-called barbarians of his day. Baif's treatise remained an important touchstone during Louis XIV's reign, when Marseille-based officers were also trying to persuade their king to build galleys and maintain France's supposed mastery over Muslims and Christians in the Mediterranean. One way that galleys were thought to maintain mastery or to ensure mastery was through infidel conversion, a capacity that seems to have been reflected in their design. In the way that the main deck resembled a nave, itself the Latin word for ship, with wooden benches arranged in rows like pews, and with oarsmen pushing forward on a footrest, similar to how worshipers might incline on a prayer kneeler, while a captain issued commands like a priest. The 1680 manual we mentioned a moment ago also makes an argument for religious and maritime mastery in visual form. In the penult penultimate plate from the manual, which you see on the left, you can see a fully armed and rigged galley whose step-by-step -step construction the viewer has just witnessed, turning the pages, moving through waters populated by other ships and a fortified coastline. Its ornamental cartouche suggests that French sea power depended on harnessing the supposedly superior strength of enslaved Turks, analogized in this cartouche detail to the force of wind, and you can see the streams of fabric billowing behind them. The cartouche further implies that what's being conquered is not simply the sea, but also its lurking Muslim threat, signified by the chained turban Turk at the bottom. If the artist was making an argument that such a conquest depended on a formidable galley fleet, it was in fact persuasive. Louis XIV sent naval forces to bombard Ottoman Algiers and Tripoli several times during this decade, and he also authorized, authorized the author of this treatise in 1685 to undertake a secret mission to Constantinople with an eye towards capturing it. The cartouches in the 1680 manual continually oscillate between the general idea of dominating Turks and the specific idea of conquering nature, the sea. Indeed, the two are conflated, as in the cartouche at the top right, where the figures evoke both galley slaves and hybrid monsters, or in the comparison of the two cartouches on the left, where Puti shoot arrows at sea dragons abo above and sailors flog wild-eyed Turks below. The theme of mastering nature through maritime technology, also suggested in this central image of a galley powering through perilous waters filled with monsters, was a key motif of naval architecture. 
According to media theorist Bernard Siegert, successful seafaring provided, quote, an anthropological redefinition of man as a cultural rather than a natural being, end quote, able to transgress divine and environmental limitations by venturing onto the wild sea. But here it also seems to have allowed for a historically specific assertion of a triumphant Catholic France vanquishing barbarous infidels who are shown being shackled or beaten back within the cartouche. And you can see this idea here, and especially, um, sorry, just a second, in this cartouche uh, detail on the left, where the near nudity, grotesque facial features, and unruly snake-like top knots of the enslaved oarsmen mark them as so-called savages, members of a lower office order than the officers above them. Art historian Michael Gaudio has associated these kinds of ornamental grotesques with the effort to contain brute forces that threaten the domains of rationality and civilization. Interestingly, here it is not only Turks who are shown being contained, but also the, quote, primitive knowledge of arsenal craftsmen who appear in several cartouches holding saws, compasses, and carpenter's planes. On one level, these figures represent man's mastery of nature through shipbuilding. But on another, they signify the state's dominance over the guarded knowledge of shipbuilding, now subsumed into the bureaucratic and bookkeeping apparatus of which these manuals are a part. Moreover, the 1680 manual represents the monarchy's triumph over the warrior nobleman, transformed into the type of cultivated gentleman who can create even a derivative, inaccurate shipbuilding treatise, and who will increasingly play a mere ornamental role as galleys begin to decline. The cartouche on the left suggests how naval officers may have compensated for these changes by enacting excessive violence against Turks and other religious opponents, particularly Protestants. Far from being contained within the ornamental margins, this brutality spills out onto the central images, most notably this one. It depicts an aerial view of a galley packed with rowers, including more Turks than typically allotted to a galley, and three officers wielding whips. The drawing immediately recalls the famous image of the Brooks slave ship, itself inspired by a naval architectural drawing, something like the 1769 plan of a slave ship from Nantes, most likely made by the ship's captain to demonstrate how many barrels, but also how much human cargo he could fit into his hold. Only when this kind of image was appropriated and deployed by abolitionists did the Brooks, um, did the Brooks image itself become an icon of human suffering and barbaric cruelty. And we see no such critical message on the part of the naval officer who made the 1680 illustration. Rather, by showing rowers chained to their benches or submitting to the lash, he celebrates power, violence, and mastery and encourages similar feelings in his colleagues. Yet even if for, if for um, him, the maritime manual served as a marker of civilization, it remained a work open to alternate readings, especially around the time of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes when dissenters focused on the persecution of Protestant rather than Muslim galley slaves judged the whip-bearing officers and not their infidel captives to be grotesque and barbarous. The drawings for the 1680 manual are attributed to Jean-Antoine Barra de la Pen, a galley officer who became a prolific writer of naval treatises and the chief apologist for a large galley fleet. Born into an old noble family from Provence, whose sons had served as Knights of Malta, he rose through the ranks to become a galley captain and a member of a new knightly order based not on pedigree but on exceptional military service. Barra thus straddled the old and new worlds of nobility in Louis XIV's France, and his writings reflect his combat experience, humanist education, and talent for drawing. His 1703 manuscript, which you see here, describes how to build and operate a galley, but it also enters into a long-standing debate about what classical galleys looked like on the basis of Roman coins and other sources, including Baif's de Re Navali. And you can see the earlier image from that treatise replicated in the center of the plate at the right. Jillian, you're up. Jillian? Jillian, are you there? She might be frozen. 
Um, okay, hang on just a second. Sorry. Her screen went blank, crashed. Okay, I'm going to keep, we, we'd like to do this kind of um, back and forth, but maybe I will keep reading the, the presentation and if she comes on, she can just uh, go back, okay? Barra's interest in ancient galleys stemmed partly from his desire to make modern oared vessels as efficient as possible. But he also wanted to associate France's galley fleet and himself with a venerated symbol of ancient Mediterranean conquest. One image from this same manuscript emphasizes this fusion of ancient and modern by depicting the colonnaded dry docks used for building galleys at the Marseille arsenal as a classical temple. Enslaved Turks, shown here, are shown transporting a piece of gilded ornament to be affixed to a royal vessel. While underscoring how they participated in the fleet's production and decoration, the print also suggests how Turks themselves functioned as a kind of ornament contributing to this maritime spectacle of royal power and subjugation. Can I hand it off to you now? Go. Baha submits a strong defensive plea for maintaining a robust galley fleet precisely at the moment when Louis XIV had decided to scale back on the number of oared vessels he maintained after the 1701 alliance between France and Spain. In his manual, Barra insists on galleys as an age old symbol of Christian power and Mediterranean magnificence that still have a crucial role to play in a changing world. A similar plea was put forth in a manuscript composed uh, two decades later by another galley officer, Gaspar Ignace de Gerard de Benin. His family had traitors in the closet, which meant that, it did, that, it didn't that he didn't come from an adulterated line of either landed gentry or military heroes. De Benin himself seemed to have been condemned as a false noble in 1693, although he later bought himself back into the nobility and procured himself a crest. By writing and illustrating the manuscript that you see here, this would-be gentleman was likely seeking to rehabilitate his own reputation along with that of the galleys. And to this end, his memoir claims expertise in art and science building galleys as announced in the dimensions and diagrams that he provides down to the exact size and shape of the last nail. The frontispiece to part two of his manuscript heralds his expertise by means of trumpeting flame figures and two enslaved Turks. Like Barra, Dubena seems to have viewed the buying of Turks as critical to restoring the noble grandeur to the French galley fleet and to himself. In fact, his dedication appeals to the regent along these lines, promising to correct the so-called decadence of the Royal Navy that had resulted from the misfortune, the malheur of the time. The Great Plague of 1720, which killed 40% of Marseille's population, certainly qualified as a malheur, commonly blamed on immoderate French commerce with lands of Islam, its literal as symbolic containment partly relied on the labor of enslaved Turks and convicts conscripted to clear away dead bodies. Their work was depicted in popular prints, like this optical view by Jacques Rigaud, as well as two monumental canvases by galley painter Michel Serre, one of which you see below. It was probably made for the city's formerly Protestant Jesuit bishop, who had become a hero during the Marseille plague, which he blamed on the city's immorality, heresy, and commercial excess. Both works emphasize his efforts to curb the horrific disorder led by military noblemen and religious officials. This assertion of containment, however, is undercut by the piles of corpses littering the city's proud new boulevard, by the immersive size of Serre's canvas, which was put on public display in Paris, and by the medium of Rigaud's print, which was meant to be seen through an optical viewfinder thus bringing viewers into close, intimate, uncomfortable proximity with foreigners who not only like today, were both blamed for contagion and tasked with cleaning it up. 
Yet, if this emphasis on another form of enslaved Muslim labor was meant to assure viewers that the city would atone for its sins, it could not have entirely worked. As much as these images of Turks might suggest the restoration of proper hierarchies, they also had the troubling effect of acknowledging a world where these hierarchies had been overturned once and for all, a world without the social distinctions of nobility or the religious conquests of the clergy and crown, a world where technological achievements at sea could not disentangle monsters from men. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Thank you, Jillian. And, um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Jason, I'll let. Sure. Um, well, there are a number of questions uh, that were sent during the talk. So I want to try to take a few of them and stitch them together in the name of efficiency. Um, and two of them that I think can, we can maybe discuss together relate to the question of disease or health, which I think was raised either directly or obliquely by all of them, as well as the kind of like lifespan of the ship um, itself. Uh, one of the questions which was originally directed to, to Nicholas Muck was about COVID and how this potentially changes the way we think about design, but um, both in Martin Weiss's paper as well as Sir Tavan's, uh paper, the issue of health was also raised. So um, perhaps a way to think about the means by which the life on the ship has a kind of heterotopic space, which perhaps Mach referred to, um, becomes a kind of, uh, a form of infrastructure, I suppose that, 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 that Elliot mentioned, and um, a container of some of, of, of a kind of otherworldly situation. Um, another question actually, which I think does kind of obliquely relate, is just about the lifespan of the ship and how long were they used? Because it does seem that each of the papers spoke a little bit about either the timeliness or, or in some case, untimeliness in the case of the galley ship as a technology that was perhaps viewed as obsolete. And so I was kind of interested in the kind of like, um, in, the, in the, the lifespan of the ship and how that was viewed. It seems like media perhaps is a way that, that it was, um, media was involved in some way. Yeah, so maybe I can say something to the the question of the lifespan, which is of course interesting and fascinating because uh, we are now at a point in architecture where we know that uh, we have to build uh, more sustainably and we cannot basically produce throwaway architecture. And of course, um, ships uh, are uh, basically have to be operational for 30 years uh, uh, because that is the capitalistic framework of uh what the ship should deliver in terms of income. So after 10 years, the ship um, basically has, uh, um, is in the positive zone. Uh, so the investment of up to $1 billion is, uh, uh, you, you get it in after 10 years. And then if you run it for another 20 years, then the ship makes money for you. And then it becomes too costly to repair it. But of course you can repair a ship and you can run, run a ship like that uh, for much longer. And I think the most interesting um, examples that I found uh, of reusing um, old ships uh, was uh, were proposals to turn them actually into floating islands where the whole question of how they behave uh, offshore in a, in a heavy storm are not relevant anymore. So uh, that you could basically create um, habitats uh, uh, in the vicinities of coastal areas yeah, and, and turn these ships into islands, which is, as I, as I pointed out, a tendency also in ship design to, to think about the question, do we have to constantly move them around the whole world or can we create like hubs where uh, they are anchored? So I think the question of sustainability uh, and longevity uh, of, uh, of these structures is, is an incremental question. And I think that would also be something interesting for, for architects and uh, scholars to, to research more what, uh, what are possibilities of recycling ships, of reusing them in different contexts? Yeah, and uh, so I think that is a fascinating question. Maybe also, maybe also the, the um, maybe also the, the, the question of, uh, 
uh, of COVID, um, I think there are two speculations ranging from systemic optimism, that the pandemic will go, everybody will enjoy to be squeezed on a boat in this collective space and enjoy this form of closeness to other people, uh, or uh, they're apocalyptic about the whole situation. They say it will never come back. People will be scared and with a reason of getting too uh, closely in, into contact. And then I think it's interesting uh, to look also into the disturbing idea of, uh, of some people in the Silicon Valley who propose to be prepared for the next pandemic uh, potentially more deadly pandemic by creating private islands offshore and and, uh, and basically prepare through seasteading to an ap apocalypse in the in the health sector. So I think uh, both these um, um, scenarios are interesting and worth investigating. And I mean, Peter Thiel has made all these proposals already ten years ago uh, of seasteading, where a certain idea of exploitative market capitalism comes together with a very grim idea of uh, uh, the future of society. And I think it's interesting, especially to look into seasteading in the Silicon Valley, because C Silicon Valley produces, on the one hand, this narrative of making the world a better place and more ecologically. And then on the other hand, it creates all these uh, obsessions with potential civil war or pandemics uh, where you have to escape um, uh, almost as a prepper to a private island. So I think that is, uh, that gives a lot of space for, for research. Um, we have a few questions from Meredith um, and Jillian that speaks to the composition of, um, of the documents that you were looking at. One, uh, hold on, uh, about the manuals and, and wondering whether the manuals followed a kind of particular formula um, and if there were what kind of other documents that existed on the on the on the print market that they engage, whether it was kind of like architectural manuals or other sorts of documents. I know you said they were kind of craft manuals, but were really more for the patrons than for the craftspeople, more specifically. And another question that spoke then also to the publications was wondering whether the kind of manuscripts, which which are rather stunning, if there were similar manuscripts for the Atlantic fleet, which I, um, other manuscripts for the, for the Atlantic fleet, and do they substitute, say, for instance, North American indigenous figures for Turks or other sorts of kind of, uh, uh, kinds of othering that, that were up on? Um, okay, I, I will try to respond a lot of great questions and I'll respond briefly and then give Jillian a chance to, to follow up if she wants to. I mean, I think there's, this is a really rich sort of area for that needs more research, the kind of overlap or the interconnection between, you know, shipbuilding and architecture, as well as maritime manuals and architectural literature in this period. I mean, there's all sorts of people who moved between these spheres, like Francois Blondel, who was a galley captain, you know, and became the kind of naval uh, engineer architect at Rochefort, but, you know, also wrote the treatise Cour Cour d'Architecture. I'll just say briefly, you know, most of what we studied were actually, you know, not printed uh, treatises, but manuscripts that were intended for a very limited audience. So it kind of counters what I see as a kind of thrust in architectural literature in this period to, to create more of a public. Um, and the manuals, the, the particular manual that we presented on, although this is true of several manuals that we saw at the Service Historique de, de, de la Défense, that's a really rich trove of of these kinds of manuals for people who want to look at them at Vincennes. What they try to do is narrate the kind of um, experience, you know, of building a, a ship from soup to nuts, you know, from just the boards on the ground to actually like, you know, navigating at, at sea. And there's all sorts of, at the time there was a, an event that was created, this attempt to build a galley in 24 hours and to try to do it in front of Louis XIV. He didn't end up coming to Marseille, but there are all these kind of events that similarly sort of present this idea of, of uh, building a galley. and. Many of the manuals, and so I don't, I can't think really of parallels like that in architectural treatises at the time. Um, where there is some kind of parallel is some of the some of these maritime manuals show different kind of typologies of ships, and I think about like Du Cerceau or um, uh, you know this idea of kind of typologies, often in this case for different like socioeconomic spheres of inhabitants of, of buildings. But, you know, there may be something there to to explore further. And we didn't really look of, look so much at comparable um, manuscripts for the Atlantic fleet. I mean, they, they exist. And I think it's a, another really fascinating area that needs more, more research is this kind of shift from the Mediterranean sphere 
to the Atlantic sphere and how, you know, how that kind of plays out in, the term, in terms of everything. I mean, in terms of personnel moving from one area to the other, uh, there's a lot of, the, you know, there's a lot sort of going on there in terms of representation shifting kind of from, you know, from one area to the other. But Jillian may have something to add. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, perhaps the most famous shipbuilding manual from the same period is often known as the the um, Colbert's Atlas, um, which also shows soup to nuts, the building of a ship. And if I recall correctly, the cartouches in that manual, which is also not um, published, um, are not decorative at all. They're just actually pretty utilitarian. So the answer is no in terms of, you know, whether Native Americans uh, take the place of um, enslaved Turks. Um, so I don't, th I, th I don't think that's the case. No. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we should be wrapping up in a few minutes, but I did want to ask um, Elliot if you could maybe further elaborate on some of the things that you were discussing. I mean, I was so fascinated by the by the way that you discussed how through media uh, Jamaica was recoded as what you what you called it a kind of a white man's grave, I suppose, and you kind of place this in alignment with kind of like, um, I guess, resorts or health, health establishments. And I was wondering, were they, were those establishments related? Like, was this a conscious endeavor or was this a kind of um, different endeavors that kind of happened concurrently? Like, to what degree was that a conscious effort, I guess, is my, one of my questions. Yeah, great question. Thanks. That, it's one of the reasons why I'm particularly interested in this early 20th century moment, because I think there's a great deal of the literature on tropical architecture does a really great job of tackling the kind of post-war moment and the kind of late 19th or 19th century moment. And this is precisely where a kind of transition and the kind of idea of climate seems to be taking place. And so you see relatively progressively the idea that you would first travel to somewhere like in the mountains where it was a cooler climate, and then suddenly they start kind of, you know, bring in some sense the resorts down closer to the edge of the water, something that you would more recognize today as a kind of resort architecture. But the two hotels that which I kind of showed loose images of the Hotel Titchfield and the Myrtle Bank Hotel were actually both owned and operated by UFC. And they had a kind of subsidiary that also owned a resort for the summer in Massachusetts. That was also the kind of same management firm that dealt with Hotel Titchfield for the winter months. And so you see the kind of connections happening between these two spaces, but kind of building on Nicholas's presentation, I'm quite keen to try and think through those. I have yet to find that much material. Precisely what are the connections between, let's say, the space of the hotel rooms and the ship? You know, what are the links between these two kind of environments that the tourist is in, a kind of inhabiting when they're kind of traveling in the tropic? And, you know, how do one kind of relate to the other? So still to be kind of looked at. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I thought those images were fascinating. And especially thinking about climate control was such a really fascinating thing, especially when we think about questions of, of, of commodities, which, which, which were addressed in the first, in the first session, in the first panel, and thinking about commodities and humans and the human body and all of these issues that that emerge. Uh, we should take a brief break to give people the opportunity to stretch their legs, perhaps grab a coffee or tea. Uh, there were a few other questions, but we should have time toward the end to address some of these questions as well. So um, please keep them coming. Uh, we will take a brief break and we will reconvene um, probably in about for a, a 2.30, uh, the same exact link. So um, do take a brief break and we'll reconvene shortly. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome back everybody. Um, thank you to our second session, to Nicholas Monk, to Meredith Martin and Jillian Weiss and Elliot Sertovent. Uh, we will here uh, begin our third panel, which is on energy, which explores some of the uh, technological and environmental components um, of maritime architecture and design. Uh, I'd like to welcome Sarah Rich, who is a professor in the art history program at Coastal Carolina University. She will be presenting a project architecture in the Anthropocene. <laughs> 